decided to read on a little bit. Uh, we are reading out of Eyes of Horace. It is a Joan Grand far memory book. It is about her life as Ra, um, an heir to the uh, Oryx, uh, the Normark of the Oryx. They've had a battle. Uh, and we are now here, pre well they've had a battle, but they're now uh, at a siege. Menhet has uh, barricaded himself into the palace, the royal palace, in the royal city. And um, the last chapter uh, described a plan how they could make him leave the Lord there. Prelude to battle, part six. The herald was conducted to my tent by two centuries. In an expressionless voice he delivered his message. I speak in the name of Menhet, Pharaoh. Hereby do I challenge the army of the rebellious South to a battle of the six hundred. All those who are not of the number appointed must swear to take no part. When the surrender has been sounded, then shall the defeated army suffer itself to be made prisoner without resistance. Hereby do I promise in the royal name that prisoners taken shall not suffer violence in their persons and shall be set free after forty days. If by that time they have experienced a change of heart and are once more loyal Egyptians, the battle to be joined at dawn tomorrow in the field of Hathor to the south of my royal city, given under my seal on this the twenty-second day of my reign." Tell the prince, you master, your master, that we accept his challenge of six hundred against six hundred. Tell him also that by tomorrow he will have learned that his message was wrongly phrased. It is Menet who is the usurper, and we who fight for Pharaoh. The herald made no answer, and I assigned four soldiers to escort him back through our lines. Kias had remained hidden while he was there, lest she were recognised. Now she joined me with Hanuk beside her. Tomorrow at dawn, Rab, Menhet has proved an obedient servant of the dead. Do you think he will lead his men himself? I am sure of it. Remember that he thinks the shades are mocking him. He would not let them add another taunt. That Menhet was afraid to fight and asked his men to restore his honour for him. Yet I doubt if his pride will outweigh his judgment, said Hanuk. In such a battle, the leaders do not wear distinctive dress, for if they did, they would soon leave their army without a leader. It has long been arranged, I said, that if I am killed, Hanuk takes command. The six hundred will be drawn from the oryx, the jackal and the hare, each two hundred under the, the leadership of myself. Hanuk and the captain of the hare, Hanuk and the captain of the hare. It is possible that both Hanuk and I will be killed. I decree that if this be so, you, my sister, wife of the Normark of the Jackal, will command the three armies until such time as Royden or Pharaoh choose to make other provision. You have proved yourself to be wise in strategy, and Sibek will be at your side to advise you and to see that your orders are carried out. Of this decision, all the leaders of hundreds will be informed. And if it is, and if it be that tomorrow Hanuk and I are summoned before the forty-two assessors, you at the same time will be receiving the oath of allegiance from the warriors of the south. A challenge such as Menhet had many precedents in antiquity. Though the number of combatants might vary from a few champions, sometimes only three, to as many as five thousand, the battle always began at sunrise and would continue either until a decision had been reached or until dusk, when there would be a truce until dawn of the following day. The immunity given to all priests under the warrior's code, held even in the thick of a skirmish, and those who tended the wounded might do so without danger, safe from a chance arrow. The field of Hathor was a large meadow where temple bulls used to be pastured and was about a thousand paces square. I talked with those sent by Menhet to make ready and, I was ag and it was agreed that they should take the north side of the field and we the south. I caused tents to be erected on the southern boundary of the field 
where our men could rest if the battle lasted into a second day, for the combatants were not permitted to leave the scene of battle until a decision was reached. On the western side, midway between the two lines, an enclosure was marked off by poles, flying blue pennants. Here the wounded of both sides would be taken and accommodated in their respective tents. No one might enter the enclosure except those engaged in the care of the wounded. Wounded men of the defeated army were not taken prisoner and would be treated with every consideration and given a safe conduct to their homes. Since the acceptance of such a challenge meant that no offensive action would be taken by either side until the time appointed, I was not surprised to see several groups of people leaving the city to come and stare at the preparations being made on the field. Two shallow trenches, less than a cubit wide, were dug across it, and these were separated from each other by a distance of 500 paces. These trenches marked the area in which the fighting was to take place, and the rival armies would try to drive each other back over the line furthest from their own side. The army which was first to have no men left alive within these limits was declared defeated, and their trumpeteers would immediately sound the surrender. A man was allowed to leave the field to have his wounds dressed or to get other succor or fresh weapons and could then return to join in the fray. If men could be temporarily spared during a prolonged combat, it was not unusual for the commander to order several to take a short rest so that their vigour was renewed. The responsibility on the individual soldier was greater than in any other form of battle. For after the initial stages the lines broke into separate groups and twelve or more fights might be going on at the same time in different parts of the field. At noon I had our full strength assembled to tell them the laws under which we would fight. Then I asked that those who wished to take part should raise their arms. They responded as one man. So I told them that I should leave the choice to the leaders of hundreds who were the best judges of those proficient to serve our cause. I told the leaders that I wanted in each hundred an equal number of bowmen, mace bearers and javelin men, and that only those who were specially skilled both in wrestling and with a long dagger should be selected. Later in the afternoon I took the six hundred to the field of Hathor and outlined to them my strategy. At the first trumpet the mace bearers will dash forward so as to occupy as much of the intervening ground as possible before we meet the enemy ranks. Behind them the javelin men, javelin men will advance, though at a slightly slower pace, and when they can be sure their shafts will not be waste, wasted, they will launch them, but not until they receive my order, at which the mace bearers will crouch down to let the javelins pass overhead. The javelin men will then make their way for the bowmen, who will aim high so that their arrows rain down on the enemy. After the battle is closely joined, half of, the jav of all the javelin and bowmen will throw down their first weapon and fight on with shield and dagger. The rest will withdraw behind the melee to pick off any enemy who can be aimed at without endangering our men. When their turn comes to fight at those quarters, they too will exchange their weapons for the dagger. Though I was almost certain that men had would obey the warrior's code, I had the watchfires lit at dusk. You posted, yet posted only half the usual number of sentries. I had oxen slaughters to provide all the men with extra food and allowed a jar of beer to every twenty men. They laughed and shouted warrior songs in their warm, rough voices. I overheard many fragments of conversation when I walked down the lines, but not once did I hear any, with anything to suggest they entertained the possibility of defeat. To them the battle was already won and so strong was their faith in our cause that they would not have been surprised if Ra had struck down Menad should be shown should show any sign of winning. That that if Ra had struck down Menad, should he show any sign of winning? I wished that I shared their certainty. Part of me was confident of victory, but my soldiers were bowed with the weight of responsibility. The men under Menhead would be veterans, strong in the confidence which comes from a series of victories. They would be used to seeing they would be used to seeing friends killed beside them, used to the cries of dying men, immune to pity. 
on the practice ground any men were a match for his, but it is a terrible test to meet the supreme endeavour when men are still untried. Had I been unwise in refusing the offer made by the captain of the reed to allow me to choose among his picked men as well as my own, then I remembered the relief which, had be, which he had tried to conceal when I said it were better that men who so recently had been comrades in arms should not be asked to fight against one another. I was unlikely to escape injury. Perhaps tomorrow Kiers would be leading a defeated army to the south. If Mary were dead, I would be glad to follow her, but my death would condemn her to many empty years. I wanted to be alone with my thoughts of Mary and I knew that Hanuk and Kiers would wish to be with each other. The path I took led down to the river. The water chuckled against the bank, a safe, comfortable sound. Perhaps I wasn't going to be killed. Soon I might be hearing that same sound while Mary and I lay together in our pleasure boat. Did I wish that she was here with me? Again, I was of two minds. For my own sake, I wished that if this was to be my last night on earth, I might share it with her. Yet I did not wish her to suffer the torture of anxiety, through which I knew Kiers must be passing. At dawn, I would have no time for anxieties, but Kiers would not be so protected from her thoughts. She would watch the press of men swaying to and fro, trying to see if Hanuk and I were safe. She would look up at the vultures, wheeling down and patiently over the field as they watched a feast being spread below. For so long I had been impatient of time. In the house of the captains, doing my training as one of the eyes of Horus, while I waited marriage to Mary during the siege of the royal city, always had I been time's impatient servant. Now, for a little while, he had become my friend. His hours were a shield between my body and the dawn, he allowed me to feel strength flowing along my smooth muscles and to appreciate the bliss of being without pain. He counselled me, dwell on this peace which I have vouchsafed, vouchsafed you. Enjoy the full, to the full these moments which pass so slowly and if tomorrow you receive a grievous wound, do not rail against me to speed my pace. That's the end of this chapter.